Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the very first virtual IU South Bend pop-up university uh, at Lang Lab. Uh, as many of you know, uh, uh, pop-up university has been an exciting event uh, these past several months uh, at Lang Lab one, uh, once a month during uh, the school year. Uh, but of course, with our, uh, our uh, new pandemic uh, situation, we've decided to try something different. So we're bringing this to you tonight uh, through the magic of, I, uh, of Indiana University Zoom subscriptions, uh, making this webinar available to any members of the public who want to join us. So welcome. Uh, and tonight, uh, some of our friends from Lang Lab uh, I have joined as co-hosts to help field questions. When you're listening to our speaker tonight, uh, you'll notice on whatever Zoom app you're using, there is a button that says Q and A. Uh, please feel free to throw any questions you want uh, at, our, at our speaker. Uh, and Stephanie Rizik, uh, co-founder of Lang Lab, uh, we'll be gathering those up to uh, pr to give to our speaker afterwards. You can stick around and hear things, uh, add follow-ups. Um, there, uh, there is a, an anonymous option if you don't want your name used, but uh, we'd love to have you use your name. Uh, anyway, uh, so uh, hopefully everyone had a moment there to uh, get something tasty to drink. I've got my pineapple soda, so hey, why don't we get started? Need to do some adjustments on the screen here. And so, uh, Pop Up University uh, is a uh, is a brought to you tonight uh, by the Indiana University South Bend uh, Center uh, Center for Community Engagement, as well as the Center for Excellence in Research and Scholarship. I'm Josh Wells, the uh, director of the, the research center, uh, and the director of community engagement. Uh, Professor Gail McGuire is also a co-host here tonight, and. This speaker series is meant to showcase uh, some of the exciting things that are going on with faculty at IU South Bend and to talk about ways that research at IU South Bend uh, it can be brought into our community, uh, not uh, for educational purposes, to, be, uh, to come to bear on local issues, uh, local questions, uh, and to help our uh, help our uh, community neighbors uh, think of IU South Bend as a resource. So uh, we hope you enjoy what you see here tonight. And if you're interested in uh, partnering with IU South Bend uh, in getting uh, students or faculty to assist you uh, with some uh, with some projects or community needs in your area, uh, please give uh, the uh, the uh, community engagement office or the research center a call, and we'd be glad to point you in the right direction. We're, uh, our, spo uh, our sponsors uh, are, uh, are especially important to us. Uh, Pop-Up uh, Pop University is brought to you uh, tonight by, the, by Indiana Humanities, which has helpfully provided us a grant through next year to help uh, defray some of the costs associated with the event, but also uh, many different outlets through Indiana University itself, the IU Bicentennial Office, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, uh, and many different departments from biological sciences through world language studies. Uh, thank you all. Our speaker tonight it will be anthropology professor Jay Vanderveen, who, uh, who is also our uh, assistant director of our University Center for, Excell uh, for uh, Excellence in Teaching. Uh, Professor Vanderveen has quite an accomplished uh, prof uh, professional career when he's not uh, conducting archaeology in the Caribbean or doing research uh, in Smithsonian collections. He's, al he's also guiding field schools around uh, South Bend and Elkhart, looking at, local, uh, looking at uh, 
the, pa the past of our local communities. He also does occasional pro bono forensic work for local law enforcement. Uh, and he has, uh, he was uh, a former, the former editor in chief of the Society for Archaeological Sciences Bulletin. Along with his, uh, uh, along with his uh, research expertise, uh, Professor Vanderveen is also, uh, frankly, one of our best teachers on campus. He has won uh, the, IU, uh, the IU South Bend Trustees uh, Teaching Award on numerous occasions. He's won uh, an IU Legacy Award and at least half a dozen other uh, significant teaching awards. He's really a lot of fun, um, which means I should probably let you hear him instead of me. Uh, so uh, again, after, uh, after he's done talking, uh, we're going to field some questions, there'll be some Q&A, and it'd be great uh, you know, to uh, get some chatter going. And with that, I'm going to stop this screen share. Jay, do you feel uh, ready to go on your end? All right. Uh, so with that, uh, he won't hear it at home, uh, or well, he won't hear it wherever he is, but uh, <laughs> Professor Jay Vanderveen, everybody, uh, speaking to us tonight about some South Bend archaeology. All right. Good evening, everybody. Um, go ahead and crack open your beverage of choice. We'll go ahead and get started. And again, as, as Dr. Wells mentioned, and I appreciate the introduction, um, there will be questions and answers. I'll make sure I keep this within 30 minutes or so. Um, and then I'm more than happy to address questions you have. I might not have answers, but I'm really good at making stuff up and making it look like I know what I'm talking about. So with, uh, with no further ado, let me go ahead and get started. What I'd like us to do, if it's okay, is um, twice during this brief talk, I'm going to ask a couple of questions of you. This is something we would normally do in a, in a, in a classroom, right? And I want you to think about things as well as just listen to what I have to say. So this first one is a thought experiment. I want you to, to look around where you are right now and, and see if you can pick out something that you think might last for 100 years whether it's a, um, a vase, the glass carafe of a coffee pot, maybe a painting, um, maybe it's, it's a candlestick you have. What does that object say about you? How does it signify your religion, your social class? Could someone tell the gender from that object, your gender? Could someone tell where your family was descended from that object? Let you think for just a second. I'm gonna. I'm. I'm not actually asking for answers here. This is a rhetorical thing. But think about these objects. What can we learn from stuff? Because I am an anthropological archaeologist. What that means is I use things to tell stories about people. Usually, it's old things from people who can't tell their own stories anymore. Now, these things have a fancier word. I can't tell my mom. Um, I have a PhD in thingology or something like that. It'd be silly. So we call it material culture. And the we here is just as important as the material because archaeologists work in teams. So everything that I'm going to share today um, is information as well as things that we found. And all of that is based on a conversation between a whole bunch of people. Mostly I use South Bend undergraduate students, or at least they were at the time of our conversations. Now, what I want you to also think about is the study of material culture regularly provides insight into the lives of people. What I'm interested in is the lives of working class people, the lives of ethnically diverse people, the lives of people who their documentary information is often lacking. So the objects are found in their place of work, maybe they're found near their households, and those things can illuminate their daily concerns and their affairs. These are topics that are not regularly discussed in the historical record, and as such, 
we explore them through historical archaeology instead. Likewise, these are some important issues taking place both within the home and within wider society that are also not openly addressed in newspapers or in novels or in governmental records. For instance, because they're seen as taboo, sexual relations are often kept undercover. Yes, that was a pun. I'm pausing for laughter. But the interpretation of these specific classes of artifacts related to marital and extramarital practices can provide a, a possible reconstruction of the social lives of those people who used those things. The political dynamics of an era can also influence the way in which members of all gender present themselves or are represented in that public sphere. Now, policies regarding sexual practices and politics were not the initial research design of our excavations in South Bend, Indiana. Students participating in the IU South Bend Historical Archaeology Field Schools during the summers of 2010, 2015, and even 2019 were more interested in learning about the local community. But what they wanted to find and what they found are entirely different things. The sites we selected to investigate, one of the sites we selected to investigate was in the 800 block of West Washington National Historic District. It's directly across Washington Street from Kapshaholm. Kapshaholm was built in South Bend by the Oliver family. These are prominent citizens who made their fortune in cold rolled steel plows. It was a thing. The lot that we are investigating, it's now a vacant grassy field, was once the site of a duplex house and a drugstore, both of which were eventually raised by the Oliver family, R-A-Z-E-D, as in leveled. And then they were backfilled later on by, with the assistance of the Studebaker family. Now, like the Olivers, the Studebakers were considered leaders of the city in the 20th century. And there are a number of very large ornate houses still standing in this particular neighborhood signifying the importance and the wealth of the people who lived in the area. Because they had a lot of wealth, they insured their houses. Because they insured their houses, we can use historical maps that provide the structural details and that describe the building use patterns over many, many decades. It's really kind of cool for archaeologists. The duplex in the eastern portion of the study area and the drugstore to its immediate west appear to have been built between 1875 and 1891. The drugstore then disappears in the 1917 map, leaving only the duplex on the lot. We were told the Oliver family decided to clear the property completely in the 1930s, so all of the artifacts we found, with very few exceptions, were most likely used and ultimately deposited before then. With the permission of the State Department of Natural Resources and the landowners, the students opened what we call excavation units across the property. They positioned them to best investigate the deposition patterns. Um, and as was expected, the artifacts we got ranged from structural material like a ton of nails or window glass or floor tiles to some domestic artifacts, things like ceramic plates and containers, beer bottles, children's toys to sundry items related to the drugstore itself, like medicine bottles and cosmetics. Among the more unique artifacts, however, were a hat pin with some um, very symbolic paste jewels and a tin that held condoms. As an aside, just had to put this out there, we didn't find much in the way of gold and we didn't find much in the way of dinosaurs. That's not usually what archeologists are looking for, but trust me, it's what every single passerby wanted to see. And again, on that street, we are literally right next to the street. Everybody wants to know what we're finding. So these are some of the things we found. One of the things was a hat pin. And decorative hat pins reached their peak in the late 19th century with a shift of style away from flat bonnets, which were popular in the mid 1800s, to hats that rested high on hair which was also piled high on the head. At this point, the length of the pins grew to the excess of over a foot in length. A foot. Between approximately 1880 and 1920, and this is the period we are studying, and it's just before the flapper came into vogue, 
the hat pin was basically a, a necessary accompaniment to women's long locks and high hairstyles. The hat pin, however, had certain other uses that connected it to the suffrage movement. The inexpensive cost of the pins made them accessible to women from every class. They were sold from uh, about a penny for five. And even the poorest women could afford to buy these particular pins. Suffrage was also a topic that crossed class lines and women united to fight for the rights equaling those of men. One reason for this was that equal access to employment was a poor woman's issue. And the right to vote was also paramount for all other rights, so women came together to fight for it. But even as some laws fell, such as those preventing access to literature about birth control, that was repealed in 1877, others were enacted regarding, of all things, the hat pin. It's true that government is also often reactionary, and this has always been true. Lawmakers created restrictions on the wearing, the use, and the length of hat pins. No longer could a woman wear pins upward of a foot. There was an article in a 1909 Evening World newspaper that explains a new Oregon law that requires the length of hat pins to be confined to 10 inches. And below this caricatured picture is, is the option, I'm sorry, sits the caption, why not safety pins if pins there must be? The reason for this restriction was the danger to men from women's uncontrolled use of their hat pins as weapons. I'm saying that with, with irony. A year later, a Chicago city ordinance was passed regarding the length of pins. Each of, at each of the hearings of the bills, there were boos and hisses and shouts of shame that were heard from women in the gallery, reports the New York Tribune. If you remember which button to press to make the next slide, there you go. The debate wasn't simply rhetoric either. Women did in fact stab people with their hat pins, sometimes on purpose. There's a very short article in a Princeton Union that reports that a vaudevillian was stabbed in the eye by the hat pin of a woman who took offense when he dared accost her hat. These articles and, and others felt somewhat hysterical. The writings of men who didn't want women to get above their place in life or exercise the rights they were trying to get. This seems less like a woman with murderous intent and more like a man who is offended by a woman who rebuffed his closely pressed advances. Now, a way to return her scorn was to have her punished under the new hat pin laws. Viewing this documentary evidence gives a clearer understanding to the social milieu of the time in which a hat pin, the one we found at the West Washington site, was created and then used and then eventually discarded. This is what ours looks like. The students found 60 centimeters below the surface of the ground after passing tons of soil, literally I measured it, tons of soil through some really small metal mesh, they found the fragment of a hat pin. You can see how small it is. Look at the, the hand model's fingers for scale. This piece has no maker's mark. The shaft is missing, but one can clearly see the elongated bulbous base typical of the styles of the early 20th century. It supports sort of an open realistic bouquet of three flowers. The flowers contained pasteboard gems and the two flowers still contained their gems. Those were colored green and violet. The hat pin is in the style of the arts and crafts movement. It's gold plated. The style and the manufacturer suggest to us because one of the students asked around that it was made in Britain sometime between 1891 and 1920. 1891, 1920, just because we have a hat pin. Now we think that the missing jewel was either white or clear. And together with the existing green and violet ones, those three colors symbolize suffragists. Suffragists, I need to be very careful with this particular word. This can be seen in several examples, among them a watch from the 1920s with the words vote for women, replacing the numbers on the watch face. The letters are violet and there's a yellow rose and there's green foliage centered on the face. Additionally, certain postcards of the day combine those three colors and phrases so that the symbolism was pretty clear to the suffrage supporters, both American and British alike. Now, why would an English suffragist hat pin be in the possession of an American woman in, of all things, South Bend? 
A look through the records of the Indiana Board of Directors of the League of Women Voters in 1923 shows that the wives of the leaders of local industry in South Bend and the neighboring city of Elkhart participated fully and enthusiastically in feminist activities. They were integral in pushing for the adoption of temperance reforms and assisting that female perspectives be heard in order that they might balance the male and benefiting from their husband's money and influence, these women had the means to make their voices heard. During the years immediately before and after the ratification of the 19th Amendment, and we all know when that was because we just celebrated its 100th anniversary, the League of Women Voters had a very strong presence in both Elkhart and South Bend. And to be clear, it still does. The Women's Franchise League, which preceded the League of Women Voters, held its first area meetings in the Beardsley House, another place that my students dug, and it was the home of one of the founding families of Elkhart. In 1919, Mrs. Charles Byer, she had a name, it was Mariah. Mariah Byer was the South Bend delegate on the state election board for the League of Women Voters. In 1922, Anna Studebaker Carlisle was the vice president of the state league, her husband, as you can probably figure it out, was in the management of the Studebaker Automobile Company. She was a daughter, she married somebody, he came in and was doing the business with the rest of the Studebakers. And then in 1924, Mrs. L.S. Fickenshire, again, she had a name, it was Rosie. She was the league's South Bend District Director. These three women all lived within walking distance of the property on West Washington Street. And at least two of them would have had regular contact with the Oliver family through the businesses of their husbands, as well as through their own civic interests. But nowhere in the local papers are there stories of hatpins and their symbolism or their potential danger. This is the story we have to get from the artifacts itself. Take a quick break, let you have another particular thought experiment. This one's fun. Imagine a bottle of medicine. I don't care what it is. What feeling does it invoke if you see it behind the counter at a pharmacy? It seems appropriate, right? It seems full of promise. It can save a life if given to the right person. Now, what about that same bottle? But now it's broken on an alley between two high rises. What if it's inside your medicine cabinet? What if it's in your kid's backpack at school? The bottle itself hasn't changed. The artifact, the thing that we study, still a bottle regardless of the place it's at. The medicine inside it hasn't changed, but the context, the context makes a huge difference between safe and dangerous, between right and wrong. We found some medicine bottles during the dig, but weirdly enough, not at the drugstore. They were down deep deep, like a meter and a half, in a brick-lined privy, a fancy word for an outhouse. In one context, you'd avoid a spot like that, like the plague. But archaeologists, we think privies are the sh... Yep, I'm moving on. One more story here about another old thing and what it tells us about people. Although our investigation area did include a drugstore and the site dates to the American Progressive Era, that's 1890 to 1920, more or less. This is when the birth control movement began to flourish. The recovery of a container for condoms brought things up, you could say. Prophylactic products continue to possess a particular taboo, a result of the politics that are surrounding the same women's rights movements. This particular circular container, now empty, very small, slightly deformed. It has no hinges, this tin, it's kept together through friction. The top half slides over the lower half to create a seal. It looks kind of like a tin for aspirin or cosmetics or even candies. The brand name stamped on the container says Three Merry Widows. It gives little hint to the product that was intended to be inside at least for my 21st century students who found this object and said, Dr. Vanderveen, what's this? The Mary Widow brand, however, back in the day, was one of the most popular versions of condoms during the 1900s. The brand was known for this unique packaging, this gold-colored coin-shaped tin, three condoms inside, 
first made of rubber cement and later of liquid latex. They're wrapped in little waxy coverings and tucked around. This brand was produced from before the World War I to about the mid 1930s. It's widely available. It was cheaper than Trojans. Trust me, I Googled it. Uh, it's my, my, my IT people at the university love the search histories that Vanderveen comes up with. So it's cheaper than Trojans, which was a competing brand. The tins of Merry Widows were sold by barbers and bartenders and shoeshine boys and gas station attendants and even, I kid you not, door to door. Our tin was remarkably well preserved for a piece of refuse that's about 100 years old, and it still holds within it a story, although the contents of it are gone. First, the presence of a marketed prophylactic device reflects the changing social relationships between the sexes in the early 20th century. The distribution of contraceptives was made illegal in the United States with the Comstock Act of 1873. The Comstock Act was named for the anti-obscenity crusader Anthony Comstock, and the bill was part of a legislation controlling the distribution of any material considered lascivious that was sent through the U.S. mail. Comstock himself lived, boarded, near the infamous Tenderloin District in New York. This is where sex workers offered their services to the general public, and racy newspapers and photographs were freely distributed. Condoms, as one can imagine, were peddled there on the street. Comstock took it upon himself to chase away as many of the riffraff as he could with an open umbrella. But Comstock could do much more after gaining the attention of other rich businessmen, like Samuel Colgate and J. Pierpont Morton. These men and others worked through politics and social organizations to restore what they considered to be morality and virtue to America once again. Many prominent women in our local area shared the same determination. There was a very strong temperance crusade that was started in the 1870s in Elkhart, which is the next city over from South Bend. Many complaints addressed had to do with the, the women of, quote, loose morals seen around town. And I'm reading a direct quote here from the newspaper of the time. Girls also roamed Main Street in gangs, hung around the railroad depot, innocently flirted with strangers, and visited the unrespectable Pigeon Street Bridge. Assignation houses, the places where, you know, young men and women could meet on the sly, was one element that powered this civic reform. The temperance crusade evolved eventually into the Women's Franchise League because men were not thought to be able to handle questions of poor women and working children and moral questions without the aid of women. Societal problems vitally affected the lives of women and children and they needed to be addressed. By providing women with the rights to vote on relevant issues, the local surroundings could be improved in ways that were, at the time, lacking. The Comstock Act prohibited the distribution and discussion of material related to sex, and thus it was in bed, again, pun absolutely intended, with the suffrage movement in the United States. Both of these movements were concerned with the political power that were stemming from the controlled women possessed over their bodies and the choices on how those bodies would be used. Still, Condoms were openly marketed during the years of the Comstock Act because they took advantage of a loophole. If they were offered for the prevention of disease, say, or rather than a method of birth control, they could be advertised and shipped. Producers also learned to use euphemisms for their prophylactics. If you use the right word, contraceptives could be sold through the Sears and Roebuck catalog. Remember those? And by indus industry giants like Goodyear, because rubber. Condoms were discreetly referred to as caps or sheaths, among other terms. And creative titles were employed as well. Especially popular were the titles madam or widow and other terms women found acceptable to speak in mixed company. The Three Merry Widows brand was marketed towards the sexually savvy consumers, both women and men. The name was kind of an invitation to sexual play. Proper women, it said, waited until marriage to have intercourse, and thus making Agnes 
and Mabel and Becky, the given names of the widows that is embossed on the tin's cover, making those three women legitimately experienced and better yet, because the widows, available. This euphemism, Mary Widow, was less taboo than saying rubber raincoat to protection, and women could ask merchants for, or even a lover, for the item without being contaminated by association. Even while discussions of the use of such items was culturally suppressed, the items were available and they were widely employed. The rate of usage was at least 40% in those married between 1910 and 1919. Because they were included in prophylactic kits that were supplied to the American military that were overseas during World War I, the use of condoms as protection against venereal diseases became a very accepted practice among a generation of men. Later, during the Great Depression, more than 1.5 million condoms were reproduced each day. This is a product that was not regularly discussed. It was nominally illegal to distribute. It was pretty darn commonplace. This is an example of how archeology span finds a truth from the ground that's not necessarily found in the historical sources. Yeah, condoms were certainly more than prescription medicine. When U.S. soldiers returned from abroad after the First World War, they carried with them memories of cultures much, much less Puritan than our own. An interest in many things French expanded across this nation, including sexual mores. This is when the French kiss was embraced. Again, another one. So were French novels filled with eroticism. So was the bobbed hairstyle that was a, quote, badge worn by French prostitutes whose friendly manners and democratic behavior had been favorably noted by American soldiers. I love that one. One would preface saying something taboo with, excuse my French. Condoms were called French letters, and their use in the loosening of sexual mores during the Jazz Age was a factor in the decrease of venereal disease rates, as well as the number of sex workers in brothels during the 1920s. This was certainly not the strategy sought by those in the suffrage movement, but the effect was what many of the leaders had desired. The campaign for giving women votes was run by the same people who, at least in the South Bend and Elkhart area, were active in these civic leagues. These organizations were a response to the perceived seedy element found in urban areas, namely sex workers. Yet, suffrage, and the growing feminist agenda began in the home. Equality cannot be achieved without the legal ability to control the number of children in that home, considering the time and expense and everything else associated with caring for them. Sexual permissiveness followed excessive drinking from the bar to the dance floor outside of the speakeasies just before and during the Prohibition era. The 1920s was a time of major social revolution. The Puritan establishment in America was seen as sort of a musty remnant that needed to be changed. Victorian ideas about sexual behavior and the role of the sexes were only a part of the social structure that was under attack. But these two seemingly insignificant artifacts that we found, the hat pin, the condom tin, tell a story of the rebellion underway. The ideologies imported from Europe by the rich and reinforced by soldiers in the aftermath of World War I made their way into the middle class. And change also came from the other side of the tracks, so to speak, carried by that same jazz music in the vaudeville. Change swept past state boundaries, it swept past social boundaries. The fashion for pins, the color for suffrage movement, the need for women to be able to control the size of their families created and coalesced at the end of the 19th century. A hat pin and a condom tin give voice to this shift from the older values to the new patterns and the cultural manners that were found in the next half century, the one we're living through right now. And that's my time. I was more than happy to answer any questions that are directed my way.
Uh, this is Stephanie. I don't see um, any questions posted yet. If you have any, please feel free to type them into the Q&A there. We are getting some uh, kudos, we are getting some kudos coming through. Yeah, <laughs> feel free to send kudos too. But uh, yeah, uh, questions are also uh, are also great. Uh, what, why don't we? Uh, I'll take. Uh, why don't we uh, give everyone thirty seconds to maybe think of an answer and type it in, Stephanie? Yeah, and sure. While, and, and while we're waiting, uh, Jay, could you? Uh, uh, I just want to remind everybody. That, uh, on, uh, that uh, on October 15th, we'll be having our, ne uh, we'll be having our next, uh, uh, we'll be having our next presentation by, uh, uh, by Professor Dave Bryant. Oop. By Professor Dave Bryant, a professor of psychology. Uh, and in her work, she seeks to develop and replicate arts-based and trauma-informed responses to reduce and prevent psychological burnout among social justice activists, advocates, and organizers for racial justice, to develop university and community partnerships promoting empowerment and capacity building, and to establish an international coalition to address racial terrorism and gender exploitation. Dave's a fascinating speaker um, and is doing really amazing work. And I hope uh, I hope it, to see you all again uh, next time around to bring a friend. Uh, and wow, look at these questions coming in. Uh, I'm, I'm glad we gave you a moment. Um, so uh, I'm going to uh, turn this off and we will uh, go back to Professor Vanderbeek. Yeah, um, first question um, is about the artifacts. Are they, where are they located now? Are they um, around that people can, can view them? These artifacts, the particular, the condom tin and the hat pin belong to the uh, History Museum, the, the Center for History, people may remember it as. So the History Museum owned that property and the artifacts belong to the landowners. They don't want them. So they are currently held um, in the Material Culture Lab at Indiana University South Bend and they are available therefore for student research. Great. And this talk was fo focused on the two artifacts. Were there any other artifacts that you found um, during the dig? At this we found, oh, sorry. We found and, so many things, uh, both modern and from the period we were hoping for. We found, for instance, uh, and it doesn't actually relate to social mores, but we found a cache, a C-A-C-H-E, a cache of modern soda cans. Basically what would happen is this vacant lot on which we were investigating was the use path, the desired path between a school and a neighborhood. So students would walk by that path. They don't walk on the sidewalk because it's easier to walk on the grass. And after one of them tossed a, a pseudo can in the hole, apparently everybody else thought it was the thing to do. So they just accumulated. And, and our, my students were, got really excited when they found the first one because they didn't know how old they were going to be. And then we found a good 12 pack of random soda cans all put in one different place. I mean, the one same place. It was just, it talks about human behavior. It's like, I would rather put, um, there's, there's, I've got garbage and there's garbage there. Rather than pick that garbage up, I'm going to put mine with theirs. But we did find medicine bottles. We found liver oil bottles and tonic bottles. Um, which you would imagine since we're near the pharmacy. But we also found some interesting things, uh, cosmetics. We found a Henri Bende. I'm, I'm not pronouncing the name right. Um, my, one of my former students, Rebecca Gibson could probably help with this, but it was, it was a famous cosmetic brand. We found a little lipstick ca uh, case and we found um, small tiles that were used to advertise the building. Basically, these were black and white tiles that we think actually wrote the word drug in front of the building itself. We looked really hard for photographs of the drugstore. Um, the only one we can see is in the far background behind a couple of trees when a person was photographing one of the Oliver girls and her dog. So it's kind of in the background across the street behind a tree. That's the only one we were able to find but we do know um, 
we know the name of the druggist, we know how long he worked there and the family that lived nearby, and there's a lot of other material we can make out. The next question is whether or not your research turned up anything about race and ethnicity, um, either related to the artifacts or in uh, involvement with um, the suffrage movement in South Bend, and um, also including immigrants in that, as well as race and ethnic. That was my particular interest. Um, because I, I study cultures in contact, and that's that's in the Caribbean when there's the the Taino who are the people that that were landed on by Columbus, um, and I'm really interested in what happens when two different cultures come into contact. So that was my particular interest at that site. We didn't find very much material culture that would either support or tell a different story based on uh, race or, or ethnicity or, or culture descent or whatever it happens to be at that site. We have found material though in other excavations in the nearby area. So we had dug recently, just before that, um, we were working at what is now the site of the gift store for the South Bend Cubs. So this is Four Winds Field at Kovaleski Stadium. And there's a really pretty building right adjacent to the stadium. It was an old synagogue. So we had dug this at behest of the city of South Bend before they turned it from one use into another. They wanted to make sure they weren't doing anything bad. So they asked me to go out and I had a bunch of students join me because I'm old. I don't feel like digging anymore. So the students can do it. And they found really interesting things. They found in the backyard of a synagogue, a bunch of butchered pork bones. I'll let that sink in for a second. Pigs aren't kosher, but people eat what's cheap, what's available, what's useful. So I found that in my own research of the Taino and the, the Spanish, the Spanish claimed to be starving when they landed in the Caribbean, but if you've ever seen pictures of the Caribbean, it's with lush vegetation and all sorts of food. They just didn't like what they were eating. They ate, but they, so they were physically full, but they were emotionally, psychologically starving. The same thing can sort of be said about at least this particular area of this Jewish enclave in South Bend's history. They may have particular commandments, statements that they aren't supposed to eat one thing, but of course other people are going to eat whatever they can find if it's all they can afford at the time. So those are the types of questions. And in, in Elkhart, we did uh, talk a little bit more. We researched a little bit more about the Native American presence when uh, Havilah Beardsley first sort of was one of the, the earliest white people in the area, which doesn't mean that he was one of the earliest people in the area. So there was Native Americans in that area for quite some time. So we were trying to investigate the interaction between those two groups and cultures as well. Great, thank you. Sure. The next question um, has to do with processing the artifacts and uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about that and specifically um, if you, uh, how long the DNA evidence might um, last on an artifact like this and whether you've ever looked at, at that. Ah, okay. So just to back up a little bit with the processing, what all of the students are doing is they're on, on, on their hands and knees or their bellies and they're using nothing bigger than a, a five and a half inch trowel to remove just an, a centimeter or so of soil at a time. And that's so that we can see not just the artifacts, but the discoloration of the soil around an artifact, which might tell us a lot more interesting things, like there's a, there's a fence post in this area, or there's a fire pit in this area, whatever it happens to be. And then they push all of that through um, quarter inch mesh. And so we're just getting the bigger things, but we're still able to find beads and a bunch of really tiny things. And then we bring that back to the lab. All of that gets collected into a bag and it's labeled very nicely and everything's mapped and photographed comes back to the lab and the students are cleaning it all with nothing more than a toothbrush and a bucket of water. So um, in that process, for us, a lot of DNA would be denatured. It wouldn't last very long depending on the situation. So if the soil is very acidic, it means one thing. If the soil is very basic, it can lead to other preservation issues. We, however, were not looking for DNA. So in this process, we didn't stop if we found anything at all, we didn't stop and put on 
on gloves. We didn't wrap the material in, uh, in, in tin foil to protect it from cross-contamination that we would add to the material. Speaking of this, we, we did in fact find a toothbrush. We found a, a bone toothbrush with horsehair bristles that would have been in it had they not degraded it themselves. So we were finding things that could have contained DNA, but our research question did not look for DNA. We weren't, we, there wasn't a piece of evidence that we wanted to find because it meant we would have moved a lot slower uh, to avoid contamination and it would have cost way too much because of the processing costs. So, but when there are research questions that ask for things like DNA, it can last as long, uh, more than 50,000 years. Um, we're starting to, not we, but archeologists are starting to um, sequence Neanderthal DNA. So it can be done. You just have to have that question before you start. Great. Um, the next question is about the medicine bottles um, that you found in the outhouse. The question was why, if you could clarify why you think they would be there um, in the outhouse area. Absolutely. Yep. So that one's an easy one for us. Um, just like when you finish your toothpaste tube, um, you're going to toss it in the trash right where you are, right? And you're currently in the bathroom when you're brushing your teeth, and there's a trash bucket, if you're like mine, right between the toilet and the sink. So that's where they dispose of things. So these folks were going out to the outhouse. They were using it for the purpose it wasn't intended. And then while they're there, drop back the last bit of this, uh, this medicine and then just toss it in the hole. That's a big hole and it's gonna take a long time to fill up. So you might as well keep throwing stuff in that same hole. So they were just using their bathroom yeah, probably a pretty safe thing to, a safe place to hide things is <laughs> nobody wants to go digging around oh, in there. Absolutely. Nobody then. Um, a lot of what we call bottle hunters are looking for privies right now. And just as a reminder, this is still September. September is Archaeology Month in Indiana. Looking for artifacts, digging for artifacts is illegal in the state of Indiana. And that includes bottle hunters and anybody else. So, um, you, you need to have permission from the state and you need to have a, 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 a degree like I do in order to do so. Great. Um, the next question is, shifts a little bit and asks, um, what have your students gone on to do? Did any of them go on to study anthropology or archeology? span Excellent question, because I'm really proud of all of the students and there are some, so I'm proud of the ones that have gone on to do anthropology and archeology span and I'll get to those ones in a second. But my anthropology, sorry, the anthropology students who took my classes, they're not mine, they are currently teaching drama in the high schools. They are the dental hygienists that you go and visit once you're allowed. They're um, running businesses. Um, really interesting landscaping companies are run by these, these former archeologists. They're substitute teaching in for Spanish. They're doing really cool things. They're working at, at local nonprofits, particularly I've got a couple that work um, with, with animals. So in the uh, pet rescue type business, uh, all sorts of people that are doing all sorts of cool things. You don't have to be an anthropologist to take field schools. You just have to be interested in learning about the past. Now, that said, there are at least two that have earned or on their way to earning PhDs in archaeology, which is just, or at least anthropology, which is just incredible. So one from Washington University, um, and another one is currently at Notre Dame. So our little school is producing real live archeologists. It's really kind of cool. Great. Um, there's a, a new question, it's a follow-up um, about your comment about having to be um, approved to dig. Is it illegal to dig around your own property to look at art for artifacts? Yes. You can dig your own property to look to, to make a garden, to put in a fence, to do anything you would like to do. Um, but if you are looking specifically for an artifact, and here we define that as before 1870, that is against the state law. But after 1870 is, is legal? I know it's weird, right? And, and what if you say, well, I wasn't looking for this thing. I was just trying to uh, put in a garden. Yeah, it's not like the police officers are, have a lot of time in this area to go hunt down bottle hunters. 
Um, but the DNR does, and I have been called out to work with them, and sometimes where people have found things and um, they got in trouble for it. So best case, mm -hmm. keep it in the ground, and, and there's a reason for it. It's not just because the laws want to be restrictive. The reason for it is because all of us own the past, right? Not just your property owns that stuff, but the stuff that's in your property belongs to in our entire culture. It is our heritage. And if we're yanking that stuff up and we're putting it in a shoebox and we're putting it up in grandpa's bed, um, nobody's ever going to see it again. So you're stealing from our collective heritage. And that's the reason these laws exist. Great. Uh, I think one time you, you even told me, Professor Vanderbeen, that the, you've done work, the, the state offers uh, you know, help from professionals like you if someone were to accidentally find something in their backyard. You know, it's not like you have to, it's not like they have to pay for, you know, suddenly you have this huge bill coming from the state, right? You help people uh, take care of that sort of thing for free, right? Absolutely. Wow. We just want to have the information and we're not going to stop you and say you can't do anything in your backyard. We just want to make sure we have the information. So we'll go out, we'll take a look, we'll say, yeah, maybe could you put the garden over here instead? Or if necessary, we might do a full scale excavation and then keep that stuff in a place where more, more people can study it later. We have a, a clarifying comment uh, about the Jewish law, um, which if uh, we're interpreting correctly, may say that um, it, if it's a, it is a higher commandment to break the dietary laws if it's needed to preserve life. So um, if you are star starving and pork is your only option, um, there is a, a sort of a, an out, if you will. <laughs> but the comment says that might not account for the amount of bones that you found. <laughs> so. That was a great comment. Thank you. <laughs> um, so do you have to attend IU to assist in the field studies? I would follow that on with one question that I had um, personally, which was about whether or not you have any digs planned in the future. So mm -hmm. do you have some planned and do you have to attend IU to, to help? So the first one, you do not necessarily need to attend IU to help. Um, in fact, you can take it for credit regardless of the institution at which you attend. We had students from IU Northwest come in and do one of our field schools. But I've also done, depending on the situation, I've done ones where volunteers have come by. So the one at Beardsley, which is again another museum, we opened it up to the public and we had young kids come out and help. We had um, old retiree, we had retirees come out. And stating their age and they just wanted to participate right so they didn't have they weren't doing this for credit in any way now the question of are we planning a new one the answer would be we're always planning um but what we try to do what my colleague dr wells and i are, are kind of we do is is we wait for a critical mass to accumulate and i just had a field school last summer um, right on the other side of campus. We did a campus archaeological field school at Playland Park. It's a fantastic one. Um, but because of that, we've sort of scratched the itch for a good number of students, and we're waiting maybe two or three years before we accumulate a good number of students that we can offer that to again. But there's always, I, there's always field schools happening. Our colleagues at Western Michigan do the Fort St. Joseph one, except for this year. Our colleagues in Bloomington and IUPUI run ones as well. So we're more than happy to let, to have, point people in the right direction to do field schools. Great. Well, um, we're out of questions and um, that's pretty much perfect since we have about two minutes left. I wonder, Josh, you already mentioned the next um, talk that we have scheduled, but I don't know if you wanna have, if you have any other closing words that you'd like to well, I mentioned it once, but I, I'd love to remind everybody again on October 15th to, see, uh, to uh, come back to us and listen to Professor Dave Bryant of, uh, of our psychology department to talk about how she uses, uh, how she uses uh, arts-based trauma-informed uh, responses to help people deal with psycholog uh, psychological trauma. Uh, it'll, it'll be a really interesting and engaging talk. Um, you can see a picture of uh, Professor Bryant on the uh, pop-up website where this video will also be housed hopefully tomorrow. Uh, you should be able to share this with your friends uh, through YouTube. Uh, so uh, thanks for helping us out with it. 
Um, thank you, Professor Vanderveen, for sharing uh, all your expertise. It's been great. Thank you, Stephanie, uh, for uh, fielding all the questions. Um, uh, excellent job. And thank you all for uh, being with us here tonight. Uh, take care, and uh, we'll see you, see you next month. Thank you.